I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you this morning uh, talking about uh, this whole area of parenting, of biblical parenting. There's lots of parenting going on, and uh, a lot of it's not very biblical, but uh, um, especially from the perspective of men and uh, how God can use us and uh, work in us in our families. And so uh, let's uh, do the right thing and start with prayer, all right? Father God, thank you uh, for these men who are here, who have come, and uh, Father, I pray that their desire, as my desire is, that we would be fed by your word and the truth that comes from it. You would give us um, a real desire, not only to uh, hear your word, but then uh, how does that apply out? What does that look like for us, Lord? I pray that you would uh, guide these uh, moments we have, the questions at the end, Father, that uh, we would be instructed not by the words of man, but by your word and principles that come from it, that we might be men fathers, grandfathers, uncles, Father, that uh, live lives that uh, uh, bring you glory and are demonstrating the working of Christ, growing up in him more and more, being conformed to the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, uh, God, just go, please go before us in this time, encourage our hearts. Uh, We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me just take a minute to introduce myself. If you don't know who I am, that's probably been a blessing in your life right up until now. And, uh, uh, my name is Paul Whittingstall, and up until January the 1st, I was the senior pastor at Harvest Bible Chapel in York Region. On uh, January the 1st, I made a transition to join the staff of the uh, Great Commission Collective, um, and uh, my role as, as the Canadian director of that collective, the collective is a, a group of churches that have a passion to see uh, healthy pastors leading strong churches to plant life-giving churches all around the world. And, um, and so my role is primarily in Canada, but some responsibilities outside of Canada as well. Um, that's what I do uh, Monday to Friday, as it were. But uh, I'm also a father. Uh, for those of you who come to Oakville, a gentleman in the front said, are you Carl's dad? Um, the answer to that is depending on what you think of Carl. And uh, <laughs> my son was the guy doing the announcements at the end of the service or in the, in the first service last night. And uh, such a blessing. You know, one of the greatest thrills in a dad's life. Uh, for me, was the day that my son came and preached in the church where I was a senior pastor. You just like, pinch me, I can go to heaven right now, right? (laughs) And uh, God at work in us, and we have a son. Um, He's married to Lindsay. They attend and serve here and have four children. So I have four grandchildren there. And um, and then I have a daughter who lives up in Muskoka, and uh, she's married and two kids there. So uh, six grandchildren, and uh, just very thankful for uh, for each one of them, and uh, God's working in us. And so I want to dive in today. Actually, if you've got your Bibles, open them up to a Second Peter 1, a 3 to 9. Second Peter 1, 3 to 9. Because as we think about, as we think about uh, biblical parenting, here's what I want you to get around today. Get your head around this. Um, God's plan for parenting is more about you than it is about your kids. God's planning, God's plan for parenting is way more about you than it is about your kids. I'm going to try and give you some tools and maybe some things that can help, or you can ask some questions afterwards. But at the end of the day, um, God really wants you to be conformed to the image of Christ as the head of your home, and what will that look like? And, and, and I really was encouraged out of this text in 2 Peter 1, 3-9. It says there, His divine power has granted to us all things, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us precious and very, and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten 
that he was cleansed from his former sins. I couldn't help but think about the, the last verse in the text as Robbie was preaching last night and the reality of like, if, if you're not doing these things, like you missed the boat. You, you missed it, right? Now, this is the same kind of verse at the end of this text where it says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And so if you want a text, if you don't have a text to be kind of wrestling your way through um, this uh, February, March, April, that, then take this text. And uh, because it starts out by saying, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Yeah. Everything we need, everything we need, everything you need as a dad, everything you need is found in the word of God. Um, I saw a picture on Facebook the other day, and it was a picture of a, of a, of a baby, and it said that they don't come with a manual, right? Um, but then underneath it said, yes, they do. It's called the Bible, right? And, and so often we spend way too much of our time trying to figure out 10 things good parents do instead of trying to find out what God wants us to do. And uh, here's a reality of your parenting, godly parenting or ungodly parenting. More will be caught than taught, right? That's been, you've heard that before. More will be caught than taught. You're going to say all kinds of things and you're going to think they're wonderful, but at the end of the day, your kids are watching you. So I already introduced the fact that my son is the uh, youth pastor here in Oakville. Um, he told his mom a couple of weeks ago, they were talking and uh, Carl said to his mom, he said, I was talking and what did he say exactly? I was talking and dad was coming out of my mouth, right? I was just glad he wasn't swearing. That's all I can say. But so, and dad was coming out of my mouth. He's, he was born in 81. He's like old. And, uh, um, and still the impact of parenting, the impact of, right? And it was probably a corny joke or something he was telling at the time. He doesn't remember exactly what he was saying, but he was just struck by the fact that, you know, and I was struck by the fact of, oh my goodness, right? The impact that we have um, through the things we teach, through the, but more through the things that we are. And uh, so as we get into this today, God's plan for parenting is more about you uh, than it is about your kids. So I want to dive in and talk about some areas. You've got some notes there. If you don't have notes, maybe somebody could hand those out for you. But let's talk about some, some foundations first, because we do have a manual for this. Um, it doesn't give you everything you need for every day, every day living, but it does give you what you need uh, to be a godly father and to um, the principles for uh, your kids. So uh, let me give you um, six foundational principles of biblical parenting. Um, there may be more. There's probably others. Um, but here's the number one. Number one, the goal of our parenting is to please and glorify God by raising kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The goal of our parenting, the point is, is to please and glorify God. Um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? So you got the eat or drink part, so that's pretty narrow, and that comes out of the context of the passage, but it says, or whatever you do, uh, do all to the glory of God. Um, that is the first priority. That really is the only priority. When, when you get that one wrong, you get so much of the rest of it wrong. And, uh, but when you get that right, you're on a track to get so much of the rest of it right. And so as you think about, even as we were learning last night, and we're going to talk about culture and so on in a few minutes, but, but you think about the message from last night, and if, if the goal of your life is not towards sanctification, towards doing the will of God, to doing what God's Word says, where does that lead us? And, and last night was in the whole area of purity and how it leads us into a mess. And uh, it was the same thing in our home, same thing with our kids. So the goal of our parenting is to please and to glorify God. Is that is that the goal of your parenting? I'm not talking about your wife, not talking about somebody else, just talking about you as you think about that. Is, that. is that the number one thing? And if it isn't, well, what are the adjustments you need to make? It's probably that your, your heart's totally wrong. It's just so often, like I did, we get onto the wrong priority and it becomes about something else. And we're going to talk about some of those things as we go. Here's the next one. Uh, scripture is sufficient for this task. The answers that you need are found here. You say, well, of course, like we're at this conference, we believe very much in the word of God and all the rest. Yeah, we say that, but do we actually live it as the truth in our lives? Do we actually go back to, 
I'm going to go back to the principle of what God's Word says about something, and I'm putting my eggs in that basket. I'm not going to worry about doctor and what he thinks. I'm, I'm going to make sure that what I'm doing lines up because God's Word is sufficient. We see that in the text we've already seen. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's number two. Number three, a foundational piece. Children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. How many of you in the room have children that are under uh, three years old? And how many of you are not getting a good night's sleep? Yeah, same group of people, right? Um, sometimes we forget when you're up all night long and the, this child will not go to sleep and, um, and your wife finally came to bed and said, it's your turn. And, uh, and you got up and a half an hour later, like you're baked and you're like, yeah, you're giving the baby back and you're like, honey, I did my turn, right? And I'll come back when they're 12. Um, <laughs> children are a blessing. We forget that. See, I think sometimes we think we own our kids, right? I, I love to think about it this way. Your, your, your children are stewardship from the Lord. You don't own them, they're his. But, but they're a stewardship to you. And we're going to talk about you are the primary person, you are the primary caregiver, you are the, but, but they're a gift from the Lord. In Psalm 127, 1 to 3, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage, a gift, a stewardship, from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, they are, they are a reward from him. And so these uh, children that we have, are, they're a blessing. Um, and uh, we need to remember that. You're gonna, if you have young children, like you, you're, you're going to hear people, they say this all the time. They go, well, well don't blink. Don't blink because like, you're gonna, and they're going to be going off to high school and then they're going to be going off to college and then they're going to be going and getting married. And, and you're sitting there, I can't, I can't wait till we don't have to change diapers. Right? And, uh, and you're like, are you kidding? I'm not sure we're going to make it through next week. And, uh, um, and so from somebody who's on the other side of that, and some of you are in the room, I, by looking at you, are probably grandparents or soon-to-be grandparents. You're, you're looking at the other side of that, and you're going, where did it all go? Where, where did the time go? And, uh, and so I, I get the tension. I've lived through that tension as well. But you know, these children that we have, they're a gift, and uh, we need to remember that. And they're a gift from the Lord. And uh, our salvation is a gift from the Lord, and uh, we should cherish that. We do cherish that and uh, cherish your kids. Here's the next one. Um, ties kind of into this last one. Responsibility of raising kids is assigned to parents. It's assigned to parents. It's not assigned to the government. It's not assigned to the school. It's not even assigned to the church. The responsibility to raise your kids is yours. Um, Psalm 8, uh, 78 verses 4 to 7 says, we will not hide them from their children, but tell to excuse me, but tell of the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generations might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Um, so much is being passed off from parents to places it shouldn't be passed off to. Um, we see it in our society. We're going to talk about the times we live in in a few minutes. But, but just take a look at what's going on in our society right now. Take a look at what's being trying to be torn out of the home. And, and, and brought into the school. And it's like, no, it's the school's job to raise your kids. No, it's not. It's, it's your job to raise your kids. Um, it's not the church's job to raise your kids. The church is a, a supplement. The church is a help. The church is amazing, and it's God's gift. And, and we, but, but you still have a responsibility. Um, you have the primary responsibility, and, and the church comes alongside and helps. I remember we did a baby dedications at the church. It's really the wrong name because it's not really a baby dedication. It's more of a family dedication. But, but we, would, we would say a prayer together. That, that although the responsibility is here, it's our job together, we seek to, and all the things that we would say in that prayer, um, because, because the, the, the responsibility to raise your kids is not the church. If you think about it, the opportunity at um, Harvest Kids or whatever the children's ministry in your church is going to be, they're going to get like one hour a week. 
to have an influence in the life of your child. And they will. They'll have a great influence. And uh, youth ministry, they're going to get an hour or two hours a week. Or, and you're with them all of the time. As a matter of fact, the school system is getting hours and hours and hours of influence in the lives of your kids. And, uh, and they're not, unless you're, unless you're homeschooling or maybe in a Christian school, they're not uh, pushing them in a way towards godliness at all. And, uh, and so let's remember on this foundational principle that raising kids is assigned to parents. That's where the responsibility is. That's uh, number four. Number five, at its core, the role of parenting is to provide discipline and instruction, of course, along with food and shelter, but uh, to core is to provide parenting, is to provide discipline and instruction without exasperating your children. Um, again, we, we had a lot of fun. I'm, I'm so thankful for my kids. I, when I think about uh, what God has blessed us with, I, I've said this over and over again in my life, the, the Lord blessed me with two kids who love the Lord. That's not the story of every man in the room. Some of you men, we're going to come back at that when it's hard. But um, I have two kids who love the Lord, who married two kids who love the Lord, who are desiring to raise six grandchildren so far that they would love the Lord. Like, I, I win. Like, that's, that's, don't give me a million dollars. Give me that, right? And, uh, and so I'm very thankful for that. And, and I realize that's not every testimony in the room. And it's not because we were perfect parents. God was good in his graciousness to us. But, but the reality is um, parenting is, is provide discipline. When I talk about discipline, I'm not talking about corporal punishment. Um, there are times when discipline is necessary. We're going to come to that in a few minutes. But the disciplines of life, teaching them and instructing them and understanding consequences and all of those things are a primary role that children, um, that their parents have, um, but without exasperating them. Um, see, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, fathers especially love, children obey your parents in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Like, that's like kind of a, my favorite verse. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, right? And the kid's favorite verse is verse four. Fathers, don't exasperate your children, right? And, uh, and I remember when our kids got older, we used to have fun with that verse. And, you know, I'd say, yeah, Beth, you know, the Bible says, and, and she goes, yeah, Dad, don't exasperate your children, okay? Okay, when it's at that level, you understand there's humor and all the rest going on. But when, when it's at a point when you're being so antagonistic towards them about something and, and you're just, you're just, it's not, it's not discipline anymore, it's punishment. Um, and you're exasperating them, and they're like, I don't, I don't want what you have. I don't, if that's what your faith leads you to, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. And so being very careful, but we have that responsibility to provide discipline and instruction. The last one, number, uh, number six in this, is the overarching theme is to win the heart of our kids so that we can influence them with the gospel that we proclaim. Proverbs 23, 26a says, My son... Give me your heart. Um, it was interesting with our children, they were very different in the way that we would discipline them and instruct them. And um, Carl um, was very much more, who's now, he's an adult now, he's like in his late 30s, right? But Carl was much more um, pliable and loyalty and relationship. Those were, those were like core values for him, right? And so, so when he... Um, was a problem child, which I know you'll find it hard to believe if you contend this church that he ever was, but believe me. Um, but, but just sitting down with him and, and talking and going, that's so disappointing. But, and he was a mess. And, it was, and then you go from there, you build from there, where Beth wasn't like that at all. She could care less whether you were disappointed or not, right? And she said, yeah, yeah, Dad, get over yourself. Like, what do I have to do, right? So, so they were different, but, but at the same time, we, we really wanted to, how do we come to the place of, their heart and the getting to the heart of what's going on is a foundational principle in every uh, parent's mind. That's what we have to get to. So those are a few foundations for us. I want to move on now to what I've just called know the times. Know the times. Um, First Chronicles 12, 32, talking about the men of Issachar, says, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Um, the understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And if you want to take that and personalize it, to know the times, to know as a parent what we ought to do. Um, 
my son, we were talking a couple of weeks ago, and uh, his son, uh, Daniel, um, so our grandson, uh, came home, and he wanted to become part of a book club at the school, right? So how's that a bad idea? Like, the kid wants to read, right? So, and uh, Carl said, well, what are the books? And he goes, well, you know, so I don't know the whole story. All I, the, the point I want to get to is Carl said, well, I want a list of all of the books, and I want to see them, and I want to... Um, you know, probably when I was going to school, our parents probably didn't really have to worry too much about that. It wasn't going to be a big problem. Um, it is a big problem now. But is, so he knows the times. He knows what's going on. And so he's like, well, yeah, if you want to do it, do you want your kid to be part of a reading club at the school? Well, that makes a whole lot of sense on so many levels. But what are they reading? What are they going to be reading? And believe me, it's not all going to be helpful for them. And, uh, and he's going to be on the you know what, we're going to look at this and we're going to see and then I'm going to determine uh, if there's some books you're not going to read, you're not going to be a part of that, right? And so we need to know the times that we live in. Uh, Robbie went through and, and he gave us a, a great spattering of information in the whole area of purity and uh, know the times, know the times. Um, and we think about what's going on in, our, our, in, in marriage today and the picture of marriage in our society, know the times. Oh, you think about what's going on, you hear about more south of the border, but it's just as real here, and what's going on on the abortion issue. Do, do we know the times? Um, um, and when it comes to marriage, when it comes to all of those kind of issues, when we watch the, the, um, the degenerating movement of our society away from Christianity, um, very post-Christian society that we live in today, and uh, we're still blessed with so many. We can still meet like this. We still have all of these things. But, but are you a student of the times? And are you at an appropriate level teaching those things to your kids so they understand? Um, when, you're, when, you're a, when your um, son comes home from school or your daughter comes home from school and, and uh, you find out that your teacher, Mr. Smith, his partner, Mr. Jones, right? There should be lights going off, right? And, and are you going to change? They go, you may not have any option. You may, but you're going to teach. You're going to help them. You're going to, you're not just going to ignore those things, right? We need to be men, especially, who know the times that we live in and are applying those in the lives of our kids, um, help them understand at a level that they can uh, be engaged at at the same time, we dare not just allow it to go on without saying anything or helping them or instructing them in righteousness and godliness and teaching them how we do that with grace, teaching them. So I can pick on Carl because he's from here, and then you guys can tell him all the illustrations I used about him. I, um, and this was kind of a funny one. When he was probably three years old, we lived out in Ajax, and, um, and a guy came into a McDonald's one night, and this guy had spiked hair that was like six inches straight up and shaved on the side and just kind of wasn't the way his dad looked, Okay. And uh, so we're sitting there, and Carl stands up on his little bench, a little three- or four-year-old kid, and he points at this guy across the restaurant, and he goes, ooh, loud enough that everybody in the restaurant could hear, right? <laughs> so, okay, teachable moment, right? And, uh, but, but just for him to understand that, okay, that's what it is, and it's not what we're doing, and, and so many things can come out of that, right? Um, know the times, are, are you staying on top of what's going on in the school system that your kids are involved in? Are you engaged in it? Are you involved with the school? Are you having a voice of what's going on? Do you even know who the principal is, who their teacher is? Are you, are you, know the times. Um, and then those things obviously extrapolate out as they get older and start to thinking about political views and thoughts about things and if, if we don't influence them in this with godliness, the world will influence them with worldliness. And uh, man, that's on us. Um, that's on us. I um, know the times. So the next thing I want to talk about, I, I'm going to give you lots of time for questions at the end, but is what I've called first things first. Talking about priorities. Let's talk about priorities for a minute. And if you're like, well, yeah, well, I know that. Well, then let me ask you the question, are you doing what I'm going to talk about? So... The first thing about priorities, um, the first priority that you have as a man, if you want to have a profound impact on your family, is God has to be first in your life. And you say, well, of course God has to be first in my life. Yeah, 
But is that true? Is that even true in the way you are um, raising your kids? Is uh, when, we, when we showed up at the motel here, it was interesting to watch because like, there were hockey teams arriving. Right? And all these people who are investing in their kids because they're never going to play professional hockey, but they just hope they will one day. And they're investing and they're doing all this stuff. And it's like, is it wrong to invest? No, it's not wrong. But way too often, even in the Christian home, that, that has become the God. That has become the God. Um, uh, getting your kid into the best program, getting your kid into the best school, getting your kid into the... And, and, and godliness is sacrificed as a result. And, uh, and so is that true even in your own life? Don't get caught up in people-pleasing of your kids especially um, so that you can have peace. And, you know, what a tragic statement would be at the end of your life was, my kid made millions of dollars but never knew Jesus. Hashtag fail. You don't win anybody to Christ. Your kids don't come to Christ because of you. Not primarily, God does that work, but he does that work through you. And, uh, and feel the weight of those words um, in your own life as you think about it. But Matthew 10, 37 to 39, Jesus says some pretty heavy words. He says, uh, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, the first priority in our life, remember going back to the glory of God, that's, that was that first principle, right, is, is God. He has to be first. Um, the second priority in your life, when you think about these priorities, is your spouse. Um, again, so often I, I watch I watch in married couples, and and so you know we we all wrestle with what does godliness look like, and we're growing in that in sanctification every day in Christ, and we wrestle with it. But you know we're going on that, and but so often kids become the next priority, and kids are not the next priority. Your spouse is your next priority. And uh, you need to make sure that you don't sacrifice your spouse on the altar of your children. Um, you get that relationship right with your spouse so that things are being done in unity, not in uniformity. You're, you're always going to be wrestling with things and your temperaments are different and your skill sets are different. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a struggle and you're going to wrestle your way through it. But, but your spouse is the next priority. And then your kids. And then your kids. Um, and I'm really talking about people things right now. I'm not talking about where church fits in and where work fits in. But um, when, we, when we talk about these first things first, unless we get God first um, and our spouse next, um, we'll never lead our kids well. When, when kids get ahead of spouse, then the children play one against the other. They just, because there's no unity, there's no, we're doing this together, we're, right? Um, I remember, I grew up, there were five kids in our family. I remember lots of times we said, you know, mom said we could. Right? Mom said we could. We only ever used that word with our dad when we were pretty sure he was going to say no, right? And, uh, and my mom and dad were pretty good at, at trying to have unity about the direction we went and the things we did. And, and you all know if you have kids, you're not perfect at it, but, but your spouse is the second place. Right. Not, not third, not fourth, um, they're second, and then your kids, and then your neighbors and friends and kids, extended family, they all come after that. And I would say this, though, because in some cultures, I think sometimes um, our parents um, get a seat at the table that's stronger than it should be. Um, and uh, I've watched that and seen that, and... Um, that seat at the table certainly is not above your spouse, right? Leave and cleave. There's a Bible, as Robbie was so clear last night, there's Bible verses about this. We don't even need to debate these things, right? Do you still honor them? Of course. Do you still respect them? Of course. But obeying, obeying is different for obey your children, and, uh, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right in Ephesians uh, chapter 6 when it's talking to children as is when we're talking with adults and, you know, there comes a time when you have to, you know what? 
we're married now, we're going to set our course, and, and we're going to do this, and although you want to love them and honor them, again, I grew up in an environment where both sets of our parents were believers, and so we, we had it made, as it were. Um, but there are times when we had to go, yeah, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that, because we don't believe that's the best thing for us, or we don't believe that's the best thing for our kids. I, I did a wedding of a couple one time, and about a year later, I went back and met with them just to kind of review what we had taught them and what they had learned and all the rest of it, right? And uh, I said, what was the biggest thing? What was the biggest thing? She said that we weren't ready for in-laws, both of them, right? And I went back and talked to them about all the things we had talked about about that, but Christmas became a huge deal in their family, right? And, and it's like, mom said we're going, and, and we had to come to the place where we were not. And it was a huge deal, right? And because they allowed parents to have a voice in a level that they shouldn't have had. And uh, um, your relationship to God is first. You'll always honor your parents, but your relationship to God is first, and then your spouse, and then your kids, and the rest of it can kind of work its way out after that. Um, that's some things about priorities. So let's talk a little bit under this about, first things first, about leadership. Because I want to talk about you as men and, uh, and some personal disciplines. Um, when you, when you are leading your children, when you're working with your kids, when you're trying to be a parent, right? how much do you ever lead with the word of God? Um, when there's a troubling situation or a blessing that happens, do you, do you ever, do you ever <clears throat> use God's word in the way that you lead in your family? You're, you're studying God's word. Like I, I started out today, not that I'm a rocket scientist, but I started out today in 2 Peter 1, 3 to 9. Has, the text has nothing to do with parenting and yet has everything to do with parenting, right? Make sure you do your add, 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 add. And if you're doing these things, this will happen. If you're not doing these things, you're nuts, right? And so the, all of that's helpful for us, right? And so are you using God's word as you are instructing your kids, because actually your, your wisdom might be interesting, but it's really not worth a whole lot. It's God's word that's going to transform a life. It's God's word, word working through his spirit that's going to make the difference in their life. And in your leadership, do you lead with scripture? Do you lead with scripture? Um, our kids need to hear the word of God. And our kids need to hear it from their dad. Our, uh, my son-in-law, my daughter's husband, they, um, uh, w they come and visit us at our house because they, um, they live north of Toronto. They come down and visit, and so they have Bible time um, in the evening before the kids go to bed, and they just open the Word. Now, they're getting a little bit older. They're like 11 and uh, 9, so they're old enough for this, but they go, and they just go like right into the Word, and they're going through a text, and they're reading the passage, and they're reviewing it, and, and uh, it's really cool to kind of watch because I'm like, oh, my goodness, like they're really into this. Um, and it's good to see, but they're, but they're leading, he is leading from the word, right? And uh, didn't put that off as his wife's responsibility to do, or putting the children to bed as mom's responsibility, and, and so it's her job to have devotions with the kids, and you know, he does it. You know, they do it together, but he initiates it, and uh, um, I know we didn't do that well with our kids, especially when they were younger and as they grew up. That's an area I've watched my son-in-law do way better than I ever did, and uh, but he lead, and he seeks to lead with a word. And, but even as we speak, do we lead with the word? Like That should be the vocabulary of our lives outside of our families as well. When we're talking to other men in the church, when we're holding each other accountable, do, do we ever use the word of God? Are we just, just using our own principles and the things that we think are important? And, uh, and if you're here and you're like, you have to understand, I just trusted Jesus like three weeks ago. I hardly even know where the gospel of John is. That's fine. Just use what you've got. And allow God to grow you over the years and the transformation of your life is going to be used because more is caught than taught in the lives of your kids. Um, the word and prayer is the next one. Obviously, you would know I was going there. Um, I found this thing on the internet. It was called a, a full body scan of prayer. And uh, I thought it was interesting. It would be good for you to do. You can do this with your wife. You can pray this for your kids. Um, you think about your mind. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, by the renewing of your mind, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of service, right? The renewing of your mind. The battle is for your mind. 
I, I loved as Robbie talked about it last night, and he was talking about repentance, right? Um, I've often taught, I taught in our church that we, we, I was always taught as a kid, repentance is I'm going this way, and now I turn around and I'm going to go this way. Right? Well, that is, that's a true picture of repentance, right? But the battle is for your mind. Otherwise, if you're just like, okay, I know porn's wrong, I'm not going to do it, 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 but you don't change your mind, you'll go back to it every time unless there's a change of your mind. He talked about it in the context of a change of your heart or in the context of what you love, right? And so, so this picture of repentance is, is a picture of, I'm going this way, this is awful, this doesn't honor the Lord, this is not what I should be doing. I need a change of mind. I'm turning, I'm going in a new direction, but it involves a change of my mind. Um, you need to be praying that God would give you a change of your mind every day. The mind. Pray for your eyes. Psalm 101.3. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. You pray that every day. Your ears. Um, Isaiah 30 verse 9. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. Pray for your mouth. Rather speaking truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And verse, uh, that, was, that was Ephesians 4, 15, 16. Verse 29, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for the building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Rather, speaking the truth in love. Uh, think about the conversations you had um, at your table with your kids around, maybe with something you said in anger or frustration to one of them or, or to your spouse or, or about someone else in gossip or, God, protect my mouth. Uh, Lord, protect my heart. Mark 12, 20, uh, 30 and 31, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Pray for your own heart. Pray for your arms. Um, pray for the labor of your work. Um, Psalm 90, verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Establish the works of our hands that God would, the things that we're called to do, the work that we're called to do, we would do it in a way that honors the Lord. Um, so many people, as I've talked about, like call to ministry or whatever, it's like, you know, I'm just wrestling with call to ministry. And I, unless God makes that clear, don't do it for sure. But, but the, here's the point. The, the, the point is, most of you in this room won't be called to do what I do. It doesn't make you less. As a matter of fact, some ways it puts you on the front lines like I'm never on the front lines. It gives you opportunity and um, but the, but the reality in, in all of that is you do your job so that you can serve the Lord. You, 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 you go to your job nine to five or whatever your job is, who works nine to five anymore, but you do your nine to five thing so that out of that you can serve the Lord. Out of the abundance of that, you can take care of your family. Out of that, so you need to pray for, I just put it here under arms. Um, here's another one. Pray for your legs, for strength and stamina to run with endurance the race that is set before you. Um, Isaiah 40, 31, run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin and run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then feet, um, quick to flee from evil. 2 Timothy 2, 22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Psalm 34, 14, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Proverbs 4, 5, and 7, 7, 5 to 7, get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget, do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. She will keep you, love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. See, those are things that as a leader in your home, as the head of your home, you ought to be praying for yourself. Is that a question? Yes. So I, I, you seem to say that when we're working, we're not serving the Lord. No, sorry, thank you. 
Um, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that is the way you serve the Lord, and in out of that abundance is how you, then you pay your bills, right? You're, you should be as called, if you're a, a mailman or a carpenter or a whatever you are, that you are doing exactly what God wants you to do as I am. So thank you. I appreciate that. If that was not clear, let me make that clear. Um, all right. Um, so that's the word and prayer. That, what I just gave you, I, I, I found that just a, a week or so ago and started praying that for myself, and, uh, but then praying that for my wife and then praying that for my kids, right? And then praying that kind of stuff for my grandkids. Um, and uh, that's leadership. You need to be a model and an example. Um, in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, it talks, verse 1 talks about mimicking, mimicking God, um, being a model. I'm being an example. And uh, I am, as I said, I, you, you're already seeing it. You, you see these things in your kids as they grow up, and you watch them, and you're like, oh. So our grandson uh, was at our house a, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, a few months ago. Uh, this is another Carl story. He's really getting it today. Um, and, uh, and his son was hanging off of a tree. He was three years old, right? We have this little branch that's hanging off, and, and he's hanging off of the tree. And he's just sitting there, and all of a sudden, out of his mouth comes these words, Oh my gosh. Now he said gosh. I was thankful for that, right? Oh my gosh, right? And Carl is there and he's just about like laid out on the front lawn laughing at this little kid because he's three years old. That, those weren't his words, right? Uh, those were actually probably his brother's words um, who maybe got them from his father, got them from somewhere, right? And um, this being an example and a model to our kids is, is so critical and so important. And so the way you treat your wife is being used as foundational things for the way your son will treat his future wife or his girlfriend. And, and the way you treat your wife, your girls are looking at and going, I guess that's the way that women get treated. Um, and what's that picture look like? So we want to be an example and a model in those things. And then the one we talked about, talked about last night is a purity, um, um, leadership and purity. Um, Impurity, we heard this last night, impurity is stealing God's ability to work in your life. That was a quote from what Robbie said, best as I could remember when I got back to my room last night, but um, impurity is stealing God's ability to work in your life. You can't speak as strongly into your kids' lives about things that are, are they're going through or things they're doing. If you know in the back of your mind, I got all this crap going on in my own life and I'm not dealing with it. So God helping us to have purity. Um, God desires you we be faithful. All right. Lead your wife. Pray for her. Pray with her. Um, this is a thing the Lord's put on my heart the last number of years. I've told this in our church many, many times. That, do you pray? Do you actually pray with your wife? Uh, Sue and I have for years. But, but for a long time we didn't. You're busy and all the rest. And you go, well, I have my devotions. Yeah, you do. Good for you. Um, and she has her devotions. Well, good for her. But do you ever pray together? Do you ever pray together? Um, we now do it every day. We do it at the end of our day. We try and arrange our day so that we go to bed at the same time. I realize schedules might mean that doesn't work. But there is a chance. There is an opportunity. Even when I'm away, if I'm traveling, we get on the phone or on Skype or something and we pray together. You need to pray for your wife, but you need to pray with your wife. At the end of the day, if you're going through a hard thing, it's pretty hard to go to bed after a hard thing if you're not praying with each other. Um, and, and so you need to take the time to do it. It's not a long time in our lives. So Sue and I, it's maybe a total of maybe 10 minutes at the end of our day. And we have a little thing that we read, and then one of us prays. And, and then the next night, the other person reads a little thing, and the other one prays. We do our own devotion separate from that, and... and People in our church or people in our ministry, they don't get into that. They're not, they're not part of that prayer. Unless you're dying and you may not make it through the night, you don't get onto our prayer list there. We pray for each other and we pray for our kids and we pray for our grandchildren. Um, pray with your wife. If, you're, if your wife's a follower of Christ and you've never done that, you, you're going to put so much wind in her sail. When you, Honey, can we pray together? And you don't get to pray and Lord fix my wife because she's screwed up. You pray, Lord, fix me because I'm screwed up. And uh, 
Um, but pray for each other. How do you, how do you, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to bed angry at each other. If Sue was here, I would say, honey, have we, when was the last time we went to bed angry at each other? I cannot remember ever a time. Uh, maybe there was, but God has covered that with his grace. But it just doesn't happen in our lives because we pray together. And how do you come to that? And it doesn't mean we go to bed agreeing with each other. Don't confuse those two things. There are lots of times that we go to bed and we don't agree. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I love you. And this thing is not going to be the end of us. This is just a thing. And it gets all built, especially late at night. The later it gets, the worse it gets. And we pray for each other. And uh, you need to do that. If you're going to be a godly father, a godly leader, you need to pray with her. You need to read the word with her. You need to seek unity, not uniformity, but decisions get made together. I, I know a man, he's with the Lord now, but uh, he came home one day, told his wife, I sold our house. The unfortunate part, she didn't know it was for sale. And uh, that wasn't good for them. Can you imagine if you did that? Um, maybe some of you would be, well, my wife would be fine with that. Well, my wife wouldn't be fine with it. And, uh, and so she, that was just their thing, right? So it was like, okay, there needs to be unity. And, and then when it comes to your kids, there needs to be consistency. So they're not playing one off against the other. If you find your kids are playing, you're hearing those words, mom said, mom said, mom said, when they're talking to you, it's because you're not consistent. They're trying to get something from you that they know is just, you guys don't have it together on that. And there are going to be things you're going to wrestle through, and there's going to be different ways you're going to do things, but you need to pray that God would give you a consistency in the way you discipline. Um, I can remember my mom saying to us, wait till your father gets home. Um, well, that was because as we got older, and we got the odd spanking along the way, that, that my mom couldn't spank us enough that we wouldn't be giggling by the, when she was done, right? It's like, and then she would say, wait till your father gets home. And it was like, oh, that's going to be bad. Right? I was never beaten by my father. I was never abused by my parents. That, that never happened in our lives. But, but they worked hard at being consistent with us. And, uh, and you need to work hard with consistency with your kids so that, oh, it's like, oh, I'm going to go to daddy because he always says yes. Um, and mom's, the, mom's always the bad cop, always cleaning up the messes that dad creates or doesn't. Consistency, that's about your spouse. And uh, then with your kids, the same kind of things. You need to pray for them. You pray for the salvation of your kids. I talked about kids in the room who are like under three years old. Like, do you pray every day that they'll get saved? I pray that every day for all sick. We name our children before the Lord. Two of them have made professions of faith, right? And, and four of them, we're not sure where they are right now. They're all going to church and they're all learning about the Lord. And they're all, um, we pray for every one of them that they would be saved and that God would do that work. God does that work. I can't save them. My kids can't save them, but I pray that they'll be saved. What more important thing is there in the life of your child than that they would know Jesus Christ? Right? You can pray they'll do fine at school. You can pray that they'll play hockey if you want. I don't care. But if you don't pray for their salvation, you failed them. Um, and you should do that every day. Every day, don't let a day go by where you're not praying for them. And so you pray for things like their salvation and their health and their interaction with others and safety and for their spiritual growth and pray for them that they would flee from sin, the very same things you're praying for yourself. And how about this? We, we pray for our grandchildren on a regular basis so that God would provide for them a godly spouse. We're already praying for them. Our son's 11 years old. Our grandson's 11 years old. I'm praying that God would provide, if, if that's God's will, that he would be married, that God would provide for him a godly spouse. Um, that's getting bathed all over the place um, in our prayers. And, and we need to be about that if we're going to be godly fathers and leading. We need, to, um, we need to do that for sure. We need to read them the word. We need to love them unconditionally, even when they mess up. Some of you are in the room and you have uh, students who are older. I'm going to give you some illustrations at the end when, when it's difficult and somebody comes and they say something. It's like, ah, what do we do here? And, but you need to love them. You still have to love them. And then you have to teach them. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9 is a great passage for this. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And that, that's, that's the, the word of God coming out of you to them, right? Um, 
You need to discipline them. Um, I'll just make one comment about discipline. Discipline is not about punishment. Here's the difference. Punishment looks to the past. Punishment is, you did this, therefore, I'm going to do this. Often, punishment comes also out of anger. Discipline is different. Discipline looks to the future. You did this, and this is what we want for you, and this is what we desire for you, and this is what we're going for in your life. That's big. That's a big difference, and you need to think about how you discipline. Um, all right, enough of that. I want to finish up with this and give you a few minutes for questions. I just called this Hope When All Seems Hopeless. Um, I, I, we have friends who have a young adult son who, who's come out and told his mom and dad that he's gay. And they're like, well, what do we do? How do we handle that? Well, you love him, for sure. Uh, and you pray for him, for sure. You're never going to condone what he's doing, but you still love him. Uh, Sue and I were out for lunch um, a couple of weeks ago with a couple whose son is now probably, I'm guessing he's 17, um, said, Mom and Dad, that faith you have might be fine for you, but it's not for me. Right? They were devastated. Um, uh, these people love the Lord. They serve in the church. They want what's right. And, and they were devastated by it. And, uh, and so now they're trying to figure it out. How do we, how do we kind of meander our way through this? Because we want to fix it, especially men. So, well, it's got to be, got to get it fixed. And, uh, and when I was talking to the mom, she's like, I just want to be the Holy Spirit in the kid's life. Right? I, I, I want to make this go away. Um, Or um, last weekend I was preaching in a church and a guy came up afterwards and he said, thank you for what you said. My, my son is a drug addict. And, uh, and it, it, those things happen. And it may not be those things or other things that happen and you're like, oh no, what, what are we going to do? There's just a rebellious streak that seems to be coming up and all the rest. And I, I, really, um, I really just want to make a couple statements about that. First of all, it's lean in time. It's lean in on the word. It's lean in on prayer. It's lean in on people who can support and encourage and help you. It's not lean out time. So often those things happen and we start to disassociate ourselves from things. It's lean in time for people who can come around and be a support to you. Um, you need that. Here's the next thing I'd say about that. Your situation is not too big for God. You're like, I, this is too much. No, no, actually it's not. Not for God it's not. For you it is, but not for God it's not. Um, in Romans 12, I didn't write down the verse, but it says uh, halfway through the text, it says, as much as it depends on you, as much as it depends on you, you can only do your part, right? In that text, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all. And so you have a wayward child, somebody who comes out, they're just whatever it is, it's like, as much as it depends on you, you can't compromise your convictions, you can't compromise your faith, you can't come, but you can still love them, and you can still care for them, um, as long as there's breath, there's hope. Right? They're still alive. There's hope. You don't give up. You don't write them off. You don't, are there consequences? Yeah, there may be consequences. There are things you're going to have to work your way through. And, and I can't tell you what the answer for your thing is if your son came out and said he's gay and he's now going to want wants to bring his, uh, his boyfriend over for turkey dinner on Thanksgiving and you're like, there's something freezing over before that ever happens, right? I get it. I get it. The answers aren't easy to those things. And, and the, the answer is not simple for every situation. But I'll tell you this, your situation is not too big for God. See, the reality, even in those situations I talked about, is there's a heart issue that's the real issue. The issue is not the external thing. The issue is the heart issue. And, and what has happened and how did we get here and all the rest of it. So it's not too big for God. It's, it's um, your job to live at peace best you can. Um, and, and as long as there's breath, there's hope. You don't give up. You don't give up. You don't give up. I have uh, siblings who've, um, I don't think they're saved. I don't, I don't think they've ever really trusted Christ. We all grew up in church together. They were, some of them came to my farewell service, had a chance to preach the gospel to them again. And, 
but they, they haven't trusted Christ. They just don't believe they're believers. Um, but I'm not giving up. Um, I'm not giving up. Um, that's true of your kids. You're, you're trying to be faithful. Some, some guys are sitting in the room and maybe filled with guilt about, you know, you have been like, a bit, your hashtag fail has been your thing. And it's like, you get right with the Lord. You may have to sit down with them appropriately at their age and go, here's where I've messed up. I'm asking you to forgive me. We're going to move forward. Um, but as long as there's breath, there's hope. I'm praying that God would use us as men that uh, he would guide us, we would use his word, our passion for him to lead our families well. So if you came here wanting 12 things to raise better kids, sorry, this was a big disappointment for you. Uh, but if you came with a, what's the heart behind us, I trust, helpful as uh, we seek to serve the Lord together as godly men 